Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Gold. I'm a journalist for The Guardian and The Sunday Times. To my left is Lynn Barber. Lynn Barber is the woman who essentially invented the modern newspaper celebrity interview. She is six times winner of the British Press Award for Best Interviewer and the author of two memoirs, An Education, which was largely about her childhood growing up in Twickenham, southwest London, and now her new book, A Curious Career, which deals in more depth with her career as an interviewer. It is no easy task uh, to interview on stage <laughs> um, the greatest interviewer of the age. But I shall do my very best, and I hope that after I have dried, after 40 minutes, uh, you, the audience, will come in and ask some questions of your own. Uh, Lynn's new book, A Curious Career, was something of a primer for the interviewer, in which she makes various suggestions on what kind of questions to ask. She says she's always curious to know what people were like when they were children. Yes. So my first question is, what was the child Lynn like? Oh, um, very bookish and swatty um, when I was young. Um, very much the only child and very sort of lonely or lived, you know, in a sort of solitary world. Um, and... I don't know what I thought I was doing, actually. I mean, I sort of realised that my family was not right in some way, but um, I didn't quite know what it was, and that was why I was so curious about other people's families. Um, but, yeah, a, a very serious-minded sort of person I was. When you say not right, I mean, all, <laughs> all families are unique. Yes. Uh, but in, in what way was yours? Well, it didn't conform to any of the, as it were, Janet and John or Enid Blight and stereotypes. I mean, for a start, I was an only child. Um, and also, my parents... I mean, my father went to his bridge club, my mother went to her amateur dramatics, but no friends of theirs or relatives ever came to the house, so I never really saw any other adults except at school, teachers. Um, in, a, in a recent um, interview with you, uh, the, um, the, the interviewer, Decker Aikenhead from The Guardian, said that you seem to approach your work like uh, you emerged from your home as a kind of anthropologist. Yes, I, I think I did, actually. Um, well, I especially remember at Oxford, that was the first time I'd been... I mean, I'd gone out with a con man, but he was, he was weird and freaky. So the first time I met, as it were ordinary boys my own age was at Oxford and I was sort of, oh my attitude all the time was, what do boys like, what do they like you to talk about I made these terrible generalisations you know, and it was at that point that um, I mean it's tragic to think of, I gave up bird watching which had been one of my great enthusiasms because I noticed that boys looked so mm, if you started talking about <laughs> bird watching, you know um, so I was, I was trying to learn to, what boys were like in order to please them and get on with them. Um, and I suppose at school my obsession more had been what other families were like, because I was very intrigued by people who had brothers and sisters. Um, and, I mean, in a way, I've never resolved my curiosity. I've never sort of felt I understood other people particularly well. And... You know, sometimes people being complimentary will say that I understand people well because I interview them. Um, but actually, I think I interview them well because I don't feel I understand them, and I have to sort of spell it out to myself and therefore also to the reader. Um, anyway, I was quite odd. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, uh, when you were uh, young, when you were a child, did you, did you have a vocation? Did you have any idea what you wanted to do as a career? Because I know your parents were very ambitious for you. Well, yes, I mean, um, the sad thing was that my mother was very keen that I should be an actress because she was a thwarted, uh, disappointed actress herself and was an elocution teacher. And so she kept putting me in for these poetry readings and competitions and um, drama exams and all the rest of it. And I did enough of that to realise that I didn't really... I wasn't keen, you know. I, I did it to please my mother to, for a certain amount of years and then just put my foot down and said, I'm not interested. Um, I suppose I thought I'd be a writer simply in that English was always what I was good at, you know, and um, I was writing a column for my local paper while I was still at school, so I sort of knew that writing was something, a sort of earnable talent that I had. Um, 
I suppose I really wanted to be a film star or a princess or a duchess or I don't know what, but you know, but I didn't actually have any realistic ambitions at all, except um, my parents very typically insisted that before I went to Oxford that I should do a, a shorthand typing course so that you've always got something to fall back on. <laughs> and I mean, you know, they died in their 90s and they were still saying, oh, well, if things go badly at the Sunday Times. <laughs> um, and, and so all the time I was at Oxford, because I didn't have enough money for clothes, um, I would do shorthand typing, temporary office work in the holidays. And that was quite good for me because it made me think, I do not ever, ever want to work as a shorthand typist. And I've got to think of something better than that, you know. Um, I wanted to ask you, because you studied English literature, um, slightly odd question, but I'm curious. Do you think that any which... I was wondering if you could tell me which, if any, of the great novelists of the canon do you think would have been good at interviewing? Oh, that's a hard one, isn't it? Um, well, I guess Jane Austen, I mean, it wouldn't feel like interviewing, but she's obviously very good at uh, drawing people out, isn't she? Whereas I think um, probably George Eliot would be too intimidating, wouldn't she? Um, Fanny Byrne is very good. Her diaries are very good. Um, I don't know, because I can't imagine how they'd, how they'd do it, because you... It, Jane Austen would interview you without you realising you'd been interviewed, which would be quite good, wouldn't it? Um, and I uh, don't reckon Norman Mailer, no. <laughs> I don't know, sorry. Um, Actually, I, I must just tell you, I had a dream about this interview, and I dreamt that Tanya asked me to recite Dover Beach. <laughs> To recite what? <laughs> to recite Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. And, I mean, I don't know why, but that, you just sort of, I thought, oh my God, she, she, she said, you read English and answer. she's going to ask me to recite Dover Beach. No, no can do. <laughs> okay, and so I'll ask you about Penthouse. Yes, <laughs> much easier, yes. So, how did you come to, how did you, did you fall into journalism, or was there a plan? There wasn't really a plan. Um, it was just that when I came to the end of Oxford, I hadn't got anything to do, you know. And, uh, and I did know from having done... I'd done a certain amount of student journalism at Oxford, and I'd done this previous children's column. So I knew I could do it. Um, but in those days, this is the late 60s, journalism was actually a very closed shop in that you had to be a member of the NUJ to get a job, and you couldn't get a job unless you were a member of the NUJ. And you were meant to go through a two-year traineeship on a regional paper. And I just, at the end of Oxford, met David, who would become my husband, and was determined to bag him. So I couldn't afford to leave London. You know, I couldn't go and live in Blackburn for two years. Um, so, and after that, the choice of magazines was really... Or the choice of places to work was really small. And I'd interviewed Bob Guccione, the founder of Penthouse, while I was at Oxford. Um, and he'd said, any time you want a job, honey, come to me. So I went to him, and, he, and it, was, it was a brilliant training, because it was a tiny magazine with a tiny staff, when I, you know, subsisting from month to month um, when I started. And we all had to do all the jobs, as it were. Well, except posing. Um, I, didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> But I did do page layouts and things, and, uh, and then it was successful and it went on expanding and expanding, but I tried my hand at everything there. And oh, did you write, did you write pornography? No, I didn't write pornography. Well, I wrote... Um, I, I edited the readers' letters, some of which were of a fairly pornographic nature. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but actually, the, Guccione's great thing was that he used to say he hired me he hired me because he said, you're, class, you're classy, you went to Oxford. Um, and it operated very much as Playboy did. It was an imitation of Playboy, in that you had these pictures of girls, but it was all rendered tasteful by having sort of quite posh articles around it, so that people could say, oh, I bought this because it had 
a very interesting interview with Philip Roth, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I was in charge of sort of adding this veneer of poshness. Um, but I did run a very, very good series called... Um, Para- that was the other thing, you had to have pretentious titles. Parameters of Sexuality, which was... Um, every month I'd interview somebody who was perhaps a foot fetishist or a madame or somebody who changed sex or a transvestite or something. And they didn't have to give their name. So, uh, and they volunteered for it. So they were very willing interviewees, you know. And it was just a way of sort of exploring the wilder shores of sexual weirdness, basically. Um, and it was quite interesting, I thought. And um, did you meet these people face-to-face or on oh, the telephone? Sure, yeah. No, no, face-to-face. I mean, often... But often the problem was getting away, you know, because once they started, <laughs> once they started, they wouldn't stop. And um, no, and I mean it was very good in that they had their anonymity was guaranteed, but they wanted to talk about what it felt like to be whatever it was they were, you know. And and my only problem was, you know, just being sort of sympathetic not gasping with horror. Um, you know, some of them I did sort of think, and obviously mustn't do that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I feel I learned a lot, and um, uh, young feminists laugh at this, but, I mean, we did at Penthouse feel that we were at the cutting edge of the sexual revolution. I mean, we thought what we were doing was important and that we were airing these subjects that had not hitherto been aired. Um, so I was quite glad to do that. Do you, do you think that this unusual first job uh, as an interviewer assisted you in your, in your, in your later career? I do. Because if you can ask someone about their sex life, you can ask them about anything. Absolutely. And also that thing of drawing them out, um, you know, making sure you don't react in a, in a sort of wrong way, so almost not reacting at all, you know, just getting more and more... And also an insistence on detail, and that's terribly important, you know, that um, if somebody just says that they fancy 15-year-old amputees, um, for instance, I would go into the real nitty-gritty as, you know, where is the amputation and is there a favourite leg? And, you know, just, <laughs> just to make everything as precise as possible. And I do, to some extent, do that in real... In, you know, celebrity interviewing as well, that if there's a generalisation, I always try and sort of, you know, let's, let's pin this down a bit. Um, I mean, journalists often talk about what, why it is that you are such a great interviewer, and, I mean, my answer would be because I don't think you care whether you're liked or not. Oh, sure, yeah. And I was wondering what, what you think, what you think is important for the good interviewer, because it is a seduction and then a betrayal. Oh, I war. <laughs> this is where I walk out. <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking more generally of the form yes. rather than of your, uh, your, your strategy. No, I mean, that, that's the Janet Malcolm argument. There's a book called The Journalist and the Murderer by a New Yorker journalist called Janet Malcolm, which says precisely that, that you go in, you enter into a false friendship with somebody and then you betray them by writing something nasty about them. Can I just, can I just clarify, it's probably not that professional, but I'll clarify and want to say that that is tend to be how I approach an interview, and I'm not as good at it as you are. Um, I wasn't talking about your strategy, which I believe to be no. actually the opposite. But you go on in hoping to be friends with them, because, I mean, that to me is bad. Oh, no, I don't, I don't <laughs> try to be friends with them, but I do... Uh, I, I, do, I do fear something that feels like a very intimate experience, which you then have to go away and be very objective about. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, but we were talking about you. Um, well, I, I very much disapprove of that. Um, I think it's a wholly professional transaction. I think that... I mean, the other great thing about interviewing celebrities is that they are old hands. I mean, it could be different if you were interviewing somebody who is giving their first interview. That would be a worry. Um, But they're all old hands. They've done it before. They know that it's a sort of game that they want publicity for whatever it is they're publicising, their their film or whatever, and that they're going to have to give a certain amount of themselves away. 
Um, but I don't think either of you should f fool yourself or, or attempt to fool anyone that you're there to make friends. And I mean, the one or two times that um, an interview has led on to a friendship, it, it's always rather been to my surprise. But I mean, I don't care if they like me, and I, I would rather expect them not to, really. <laughs> What's your favorite kind of interviewee? What's the dream? I like people who are very temperamental, who are difficult, um, who are, you know, if I read words like mad, tantrums, badly behaved, I think, oh, yes. <laughs> um, and if I read something like National Treasure, I think, mm. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I like... Um, very sort of rude, shouty, older men. Well, there aren't many older men now, I'm so old myself, but... Um, um, I mean, that's what my father was like, and I'm very comfortable in a challenging sort of relationship like that. Um, and I, I'm not very good at what I think of as touchy-feely interviews, you know. Um, I can't do sympathetic very well. Um, so I'd rather... But, but I am, as it were, sympathetic to people who are quite difficult, because I often can sort of see why they're quite difficult. I've just done Courtney Love, and she was good and difficult, and I liked her a lot, actually. Has anyone ever walked out on an interview with you? Um, well, there was a strange sort of showdown with Alan Wicker, where he sort of suddenly... <laughs> And I know this sounds terrible. I'd asked if he ever went to prostitutes when he was a soldier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this was not entirely out of the blue, because he was talking about how, during the war, all the normal standards went by the board and people found themselves doing blah, blah, blah. But anyway, he found that question incredibly offensive. And he walked out. But we were having lunch in his own house, so I just stayed <laughs> at the table. <laughs> Did he answer the question? Uh, no, he came back very huffily, and oh, that was really funny, and said as if, uh, you know, I put it to you that you worked for Penthouse magazine. And I was obviously meant to go, oh, you found out. And I said, yeah. Um, and uh, he, he was sort of flummoxed by this. He thought I should be ashamed of that. And I said, no, most very enjoyable. Anyway, I don't think I've had anyone walk out. I've had some interviews where I've drawn such a blank. And um, the worst one was John Thor, where he literally... I mean, I, I don't know why he gave the interview, because he was just, yes, no, yes, no, really hostile. And, you know, I've just come back and sort of said, I can't, I can't write this. Um, it, but, I mean, I'm prepared... Well, the other thing is, especially towards the end of an interview, you, could, you feel, oh, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you walked out now, you know, because I've already got a good 40 minutes in the bag. Um, so I'm, I might get a bit ruder towards the end. Um, <laughs> have you ever asked um, a question that you hoped would offend in, 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 in the hope of a, the interview getting a bit more exciting? Um... I probably have. I must say, I can't think of one at the moment. But if an interview has got a bit too cosy, um, I try and stir it up a bit by sort of saying something like, um, I get the impression that you're rather... that you're a bit self-righteous. I mean, I, I'll sort of air a thought um, and then see what comes back. And it's amazing how often, in answering that question they will actually say something that makes them sound more self-righteous than anything that they've said to the two. You know. So it's quite good for sort of firming up an impression that I've got, and then they come back and make it even stronger. So I don't mind doing that. Um, and, uh, or I might sort of sometimes say, I I'm afraid that you're going to come out of this interview sounding a bit smug. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then perhaps they will... I don't know. Well, sometimes, often they'll sound even more smug. You know, well, given the list of my achievements, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's one way, I find, of sort of waking an interview up when it's got into a dull group. Because do you have this thing that you... There's a sort of 
tentative bit at the, min at the beginning of an interview where you're both sort of fishing around and trying to get the hang of the other person. Um, and, th and then it can get into a sort of comfortable but not exciting sort of area. And it's at that point that I try and sort of do something. I wanted to ask you about your interview with Jimmy Savile. Yeah. Because you were the only person uh, of all the times he was interviewed who actually asked him about the rumours. And I was wondering whether you, whether, well, whether you were afraid to do it. Why you asked him? Um, no, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly made up my mind beforehand to ask him. This was in 1992, was it, when he'd just been knighted and he'd raised zillions of pounds for charity. Um, and, but everyone in Fleet Street, when I mentioned, because one of the things I often do is I say I'm about to interview so-and-so, just to pick up any sort of floating gossip or floating opinions, you know. Um, and everyone said, you know, he likes little girls. And then, of course, I, I'd say, you know, do you know anyone it's happened to, or do you know... They never did, so you wondered if it was just one of these sort of circular rumours that went on going round and round. Um, but, no, I decided to ask him about it, but my problem was sort of thinking at what point I was going to ask him about it. And actually, he almost brought it up himself because he said it was such a relief to get his knighthood um, because it put, it, it put to rest all these rumours about him. And at that point, I was able to say, do you mean the rumours that you like little girls? So he obviously knew that there were these rumours out there. And, you know, people have subsequently said, well, why didn't you expose him as a paedophile? The answer is we have these things called libel laws, you know, and if I had no evidence at all that he was a paedophile, all I could say, which I did say, was that there are persistent rumours. Um, and that... you. I mean, I think that we do have some very heavy libel laws, and it's, it's bad. It, it's a bad situation when journalists all know, know something and agree on it, but have never put it out to the public, you know. And, um, my editor at the Sunday Express, Sir John Juna, um, had told me that you couldn't be sued for libel if you pose something as a question, which is what I did with Jimmy Savile. And then... Uh, and then you have to print the answer as given. You have to be really careful about doing that, you know, that, of course, they totally deny it. But at least by asking the question, you've sort of framed something. Have, has anyone ever burst into tears on you? Yes. Um, quite, quite odd people. But, I mean, um, Julian Fellows, for some reason, I, and I mean, he doesn't look like a sort of tearful Who? man. Sorry? Julian Fellows. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, but what was that? That was, um, actually, I've had, it's quite often happened, but I don't actually think it's because of a question I'd asked. Although in Julian Fellow's case, it was something about a lost love. There had been an early girlfriend who'd, who turned him down, and he started crying talking about that. But um, uh, I, w I went to interview Brian Sewell, the art critic, and this had had to, he'd, well, he'd said flatly no, but we had a mutual friend, and through the mutual friend, um, it, he said, well, Brian Sewell will ask you to tea, and if you want to take your t tape recorder, you can, um, but if he regrets the conversation afterwards, you've got to forget it's ever taken place, which I've now been praying, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, just as I came in the house... Um, there was a, a party of those little Kensington prep school children in very sweet sort of um, matching uniforms. Just so I was sort of saying hello, Brian. And I said, "Were you one of the, ever one of those sweet little boys out there?" And he just burst into tears and said, "No." <laughs> so that was a bad start, and he did indeed say that I couldn't write it up. But um, no, it sometimes happened. But I slightly think. Oh, Julie Birchall cries. Have, I mean, but yes. there are people who cry to everyone, basically. Um, <laughs> I, don't think I've, I don't think I've ever driven a non-crier to crying, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> so if the dream interview is someone temperamental, who is 
difficult. Nightmare. Starry. I like starry. I like tall poppies. I like people who are not afraid to, you know, uh, be different. And that, that's why I'm sort of creeped out by actors, because they're too eager to please, basically. Um, although, having said that, I mean, I had some very good fun actors, uh, the sort of Peter O'Toole, Richard Harris generation, who weren't sort of creepily eager to please, but were hell, hell raiser was the expression used. Um, I remember you did an extraordinary interview with Jeremy Irons. Oh, yes. I really did not like Jeremy Irons. Well, you were very angry because he was rude to the waiter. Yes, he was. I, it always annoys me if people do that. But, no, well, I was rude. I mean, I had this thing of having something like a dozen appointments with Jeremy Irons in my in my diary that were then cancelled at the last minute. But basically, my entire life had been put on hold till I actually got this interview. Um, and, and then it was a, um, a hotel in central London somewhere, and a waiter came in rather, you know, pleased with himself and served some, a tray of coffee. And, you know, sort of, how do you do, how do you do? And he slightly spilt some coffee. And Jeremy Irons just sort of went like that and uh, made him, you know, wipe it up. He was horrible. He was a really horrible man. But um, <laughs> he wrote me one of the best thank you letters. said, thank you for your... I mean, I'd, I'd been as hostile as I possibly could in this interview. <laughs> um, he, but he wrote a very witty letter back. He said, naturally, I didn't agree with it, but my wife says to tell you she agrees with every word. You know, so <laughs> that was good. <laughs> well, there's no greater compliment than, yes. than the wife saying <laughs> Absolutely. That you're right. Yeah. Um, yes, I wanted to ask you about responses to your interviews, because um, one of my favourite interviews of yours is with Melvin Bragg, um, in which, uh, from memory, I recall that you, uh, that you concluded that, that he was a possibly a great artist who was lost to television. No, he didn't. <laughs> well, you said you mourned a great novelist lost, and I said... You, you I said I thought he did, possibly, or I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I just... <laughs> I thought he was someone who was spoiled by vanity, really, and it used to particularly irritate me because he had this, um, these interviews on the South Bank show where he'd got people who I would have cut my arm off to interview, um, and then interviewed them in a very, very lazy manner and devoted about half the programme to reaction shots of him looking gorgeous. <laughs> um, so I, I really, um, well, despised him, I suppose. Um, but, <laughs> but having said that, I mean, he has to some extent redeemed himself because he did that really, really good interview with... Dennis Potter when he was dying, didn't he? Um, do you remember the television playwright? Do I mean Dennis Potter who wrote? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, that was wonderful, and he, you know, he, he suppressed his vanity. But no, I mean he's not somebody I admire. Um, <laughs> I'll check. <laughs> Do I have to? <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, I was going to ask who was the ang who's been the angriest with you of any interviewee after you've written it. Yes. Um, well, Melvin Bragg was very angry. <laughs> and, How um, did he show his anger? He wrote a very disgusting novel called Crystal Rooms um, with a character of a of a woman interviewer. Not. <laughs> Um, clearly based on me. That's a lot um, of energy. Yeah. A whole absolutely, novel. Absolutely. Um, and a very trashy novel, too. Um, <laughs> so, so he was obvi obviously angry. The one who was um, sort of incoherently angry was Art Garfunkel. Oh, um, that's interesting. I know. And actually rang me up uh, at work to sort of rant at me and saying, you know, I've never, I will never give another concert. You've ruined my career. I'm just not going to go in front of the public anymore if that's your attitude. Uh, this is for the Sunday Express magazine. I mean, they're not exactly his core audience anyway, I would have thought. Um, but um, I sort of said, oh, well, you know, sorry. <laughs> I mean, what can you do? And I mean, in fact, he did have some more career. I really... I don't think it's my job to mind if they're upset. I think my job is to serve the readers. And 
and let the fleck fall where it may is what I'm about. Um, when An Education came, came out as a movie, you, were, you became a, an interviewee. Mm, mm. And um, how, was, how was that for you? Oh, it was odd. And, uh, uh, well, it was quite interesting, um, except it, it sort of went on too long because my book came out and I did some interviews for that. And then the film came out, so there was sort of another round of it. Um, but I wasn't a novice at being interviewed because I've always given interviews. Um, I, my husband used to teach media studies and I would do a lecture on interviewing once a year and say if any of you are interested in you know, uh, writing celebrity interviews, go away and interview somebody and I'll critique it. Um, and I'd say, go away and interview a celebrity, and more often than not, thinking they were the first person who'd ever done it, whereas, in fact, it was almost routine. They'd say, can I interview you? <laughs> um, so I did that. So I, I wasn't a complete novice at being interviewed, but I suppose it made me wary um, of, well, just always having to say... I mean, luckily, by the time education came up, my children were grown up, you know, but I can totally see that if you had children at, at school and you were giving interviews, you, there are some things I wouldn't have said at that stage about my promiscuity at Oxford or something, you know. I mean, I, I can say it later, but I wouldn't <laughs> like them to go to nursery. <laughs> Well, not nursery, whatever. <laughs> um, about that, you said that you were surprised that people were excited. Was it Desert Island Discs? Yes. Well, I said... No, what, what surprised me was that I said in the book that I did have this extraordinary patch of promiscuity at Oxford, you know, which was very odd, because it was just like sort of two terms of full-out promiscuity. And then as suddenly as I'd started, I just stopped. I and mean, it wasn't because I met David, because I didn't make, meet David for some while afterwards. Um, but I'd said that in education. And then, of course, Kirsty asked me about it on Desert Island Disc, which I'd sort of guessed she might do. Um, and then, of course, the tabloids all came out. She slept with 50 men at Oxford. You know, that's slag. Um, <laughs> And the point I was trying to make, or, or the reason I included it at all, was that when I was uh, young, um, the idea was that if you slept around, no nice man will ever marry you. Um, and, you know, the whole tenor of my book um, was to say, well, I slept around and a very nice man married me, you know, so don't believe that. Don't believe any of the sexual scare stories that people try and tell you. Were you happy with an education, the film? Did you feel oh, yeah. it was a... Did you recognise yourself in Kerry Mulligan's performance? Yes, I mean, I, was, I, was, I just thought it was a really good film, actually. And I was, um, I was to some extent, sort of ready for it because um, I'd seen various scripts, various draft scripts as they went, and I'd watched a bit of the filming. Um, so it didn't come... Abs there wasn't a sudden moment where I saw it for the first time. No, but I was totally happy with it. I mean, and really, you know, very grateful indeed, especially to Nick Hornby for the script and for Carrie Mulligan for such a good performance. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Jarvis Cocker. Yeah. Because I've read, I think I've read all your interviews, <laughs> and you did say in the Jarvis Cocker one that you had, uh, you had a problem when you were approaching it because you were a fan. Yes. So I was wondering if you'd tell me a bit more about, about interviewing him. Oh, I'll tell you that in a minute, but I'll, I'll just say why, why you can't write as a fan, because um, whatever stance you adopt to the person you're interviewing, you are sort of throwing the readers into the same stance, you know. So if I start saying, um, you know, it's my absolute dream to meet Jarvis Cocker, I can imagine a lot of readers sort of going, hmm, well, it's not mine, you know, and... <laughs> And so you have to have... But, but actually, I was a huge fan. But the other great mistake was that... Um, well, he, he said... He suggested that we meet in a sort of greasy spoon cafe in Islington, and I didn't fancy that. Um, so then some ideas for where to meet. I'd asked if I'd come to his flat, and he, I couldn't. Um, it ended up with him coming to my house, and... 
um, I was to give him breakfast, and that was very odd, actually, because I realized that me, as a nice hostess, trying to cook somebody breakfast, is sort of not the same person as me in an interview. And I, I sort of couldn't do them both at the same time, you know. And, I mean, it worked out quite well, but I noticed that later on, when I went to interview him at his flat in Paris, um, we had to cook lunch for his stepson or stepdaughter, I think. And that was the same sort of thing of trying to, trying to ask interview-type questions while also saying, where's the knives and forks, you know? And it, I just couldn't... It, it confused me, really. And I realised that there is, as it were, a, a, a cut-off between the real me um, and me, the interviewer. Um, I also wanted to ask you about Kirk Douglas, because that is, oh, yeah. that is one of my, my favourite of your <laughs> interviews, though, though it is quite an old one, in which you accused him brilliantly of anecdotage. Well, yeah. Well, you get that an awful lot with actors, but he was one of the worst. The tr and the trouble with us actors is that the, they go on chat shows, and anecdotes work quite well on chat shows, you know, and, uh, in fact, they probably would rather have an anecdote, a sort of prepared piece, than um, a real interview. Um, but with Kirk Douglas, I was trying to ask him questions, and he would just veer off into these interminable... And the other thing is, they went on so long, and I think they almost all involved golf of some sort. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I just couldn't get questions in, because the interviews, the anecdotes just went seamlessly on, and then doing and doing, and, doing. and in the end, I was just sort of, you know, madly blurting out, what would you say if your son was gay? Um, just as a way of sort of <laughs> trying, thinking, you know, I've only got another 10 minutes, I must ask a question. And, um, and actually, that, that resulted in some nice letters, I don't think, uh, from some friends of his saying I got him. I mean, when you, when you began your career as an interviewer, it's almost like no one ever had the amazing idea before of writing up what they were actually like. Yes. Um, though you, of course, did it, did it with, with, with great skill. And I was wondering whether you've noticed whether, in the course of your career, interviewing has changed what people are prepared to tell you. Has it become very controlled? Oh, yes. I mean... PRs now sort of run the show and try and tell you, well, they limit the time you can spend, they insist on sitting in, then they ask things like, can we have copy approval, which, thank God, the Sunday Times still says no, and can we have picture approval. So, yes, much more controlled. Um, and they are... Because, as it were, the demand for celebrities has hugely expanded in that... Nowadays, there's whole magazines devoted to them, and then also every newspaper now has some sort of celebrity interview slot. Whereas when I started, it was really quite an odd, odds and ends sort of thing to do. Um, whereas the number of sort of real stars, I suppose, remains fairly constant, unless you include all those weirdo reality television people you've never heard of. Um, but... Um, Yes, it's harder to get them. What? What? I think someone's. I think someone's collapsed. Someone's what? I think someone's collapsed. Oh dear. Okay, we're we're just going to stop for a moment. What happened? Someone fainted. Killed. Yeah. Shall we? Shall we clear off or just okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we could have a cigarette. Oh, there's loads of dogs, so that's quite good. Actually, we're... Uh, 
when we come back, maybe we should go straight into questions, do you think? Um, not long. 20 minutes. Should we do some questions? Um, okay, uh, apparently the person who was injured is not very seriously injured, um, I hope. So we'll, we'll go to some questions. Um, uh, yes, there's um, a lady in the front row. And then uh, the, the lady uh, about 12 rows back on the left, please. Uh, I'm part of the way through your book at the moment and really enjoying it. Thanks. You mention in it about the things you're scared of. And I was quite fascinated, and I wonder what it is about fish that's so frightening. Fish. <laughs> I don't mind them too much if they're, A, filleted, their heads are off and they're covered in breadcrumbs. It's just the sight of, as it were, a real fish. Um, I don't know, but they do freak me out. And, Somewhere, I've forgotten where I was recently, um, they had a sort of aquarium all down the side of the corridor. So I was actually sort of having to walk past fish and kept thinking, suppose, in the aquarium first. I don't know what I thought would, you know, I just don't like them, basically. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of prefer to be among snakes, I think. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, there's a lady there and a gentleman there, about 12 rows back. Oh, sorry, to the left. Hello, Lynn. How would you critique this interview? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it, it sort of came to rather an abrupt end, but it was fine. And, uh, <laughs> um, I think it, it was all right, but I'll have to tell her off afterwards about this attitude that you have to make friends with people. I really <laughs> don't think you do. <laughs> Yes, um, um, could you say, just say something about the techniques you use in the interview, like how much preparation yeah. do you do? And also, you mentioned about having a tape recorder. Is that always the uh, case? And oh, what happens yeah. if people say we don't want to be tape recorded? Just how you sort of deal with those situations. Thank um, you. I, for me, it has to be recorded, because um, I have... I, although I trained in shorthand, I certainly can't do it now. And my memory is completely unreliable as well. So... Unless it's tape recorded, it doesn't exist. Um, I think probably I tell anyone beforehand that I will be using a tape recorder, so if that's a problem, then, uh, you know, and they say, well, I can't do it then. Um, I, w I wouldn't do it. I mean, I just couldn't write an interview from memory. Um, and actually what I find is even people who sort of profess themselves to be a bit self-conscious, you know, say they don't like talking into one of those things. I mean, nowadays you can have a very, very tiny tape recorder, and I think if you just s s sort of put it down, switch it on, and then start asking questions, you can soon quite quickly f make them forget that there is a tape recorder. Um, and as for preparation, I just do tons and tons. I do as much as I possibly can because it all saves time in the interview if I know my stuff. Uh, you know, I've got some sort of focus of what I want to ask about. Um, and I don't want to have to ask questions that I could have found answered on Google, you know. Can I ask? Yes? Uh, this is a bit of a two-part question. Um, a, word. a bit of a two-part question. Okay. Um, I read some remarks attributed to Michael Parkinson in the last few days who bemoaned the demise of the interview, and I'd be interested what your opinion of that is, but also, who are the interviewers uh, you admire most and why? Are, are you talking about television interviewers? Um, because for press interviewers, probably I am the one I admire most. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then there's a crop of young ones, of whom I'd include Tanya and a colleague of mine called Camilla Long. There's lots of very good ones, actually. Um, but television interviews, I mean, it is a very different game. I think what Parkinson was lamenting was the demise of the sort of chat show that he did. Um, but I think probably its time had come, actually, just that it... it it was beginning to feel so tired and uh, such a flat formula. And I think that Graham Norton managed to revive the formula a bit. Um, 
but it, it's still that thing of sort of trundling somebody on for a quarter of an hour, tell a couple of anecdotes, say how wonderful they are and go away. I don't think there's much future for that, really. Do you think Parkinson was a good interviewer? No, I think he's terrible, I say. No, I agree. No, the, the one I really admired, uh, who never gets any credit, was Russell Harty in the early days. <laughs> Oh, good. And actually, Graham Norton, I think, is very good, too, because um, not so much as he sort of bounces reactions out of people, which are sometimes quite revealing. I, I think he's good. Can I ask a question? Um, what, is there anybody that you would... I'm over here on, the, on your right-hand side. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, is, if we're in the fashion of two-part ones, I'll, I'll do two-part. But the first part is, is, um, is there anybody that you have turned down to interview or somebody who you would say no to? Um, and the second part is, do you have any tricks for how to stop celebrities particularly just doing the story, same stories that they've repeated and just getting them off that track that they would be on? Yes, um, I'll answer the second bit first. I mean, there's not exactly tricks, but if somebody embarks on an anecdote... I now sort of say, I, I will now butt in and say, oh, yes, I always love that story. <laughs> um, and meaning, you know, um, and then try and quickly sort of say, has anything similar happened to you since, sort of thing, or, you know, try and spark it along that way. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the first bit now. <laughs> Is there anyone you've, you've said down? no to, or you oh, would yeah. say no to? Well, I mean, the way it works is that my um, editor will sort of suggest float names past me. And, yeah, I quite often say no if I don't think... You know, if I... I, if I well, I'm not very interested in them, or there's somebody I don't want to um, give that much attention to, as it were. Um, so, yes, I say no to quite a lot of people, actually. Um, I wanted to ask you if there's anyone you've chased for years and years but never got, your holy oh. grail. Yes, oh yeah, I have. Um, I mean, I chased Lucy and Freud, that, and I really broke my heart, you know, over trying to get an interview with Lucy and Freud and writing to him almost weekly for ages and not getting, not getting him. Um, and... Um, I mean, I haven't chased him because it wouldn't do me any good, but I've always wanted to interview Rupert Murdoch. And, you know, have, whenever there's an opportunity meeting somebody who knows him or sort of said... I've always sort of said, is there any chance that Rupert Murdoch would ever give me an interview? To which the answer is always no, obviously. <laughs> and it was quite funny once. I was... Uh, I go bird watching at a place called Cly on the north. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I was out on the marsh bird watching, and the daughter of the house I was saying comes running out to me and says, "Lynn, Lynn, Rupert Murdoch has just landed in a helicopter in a field over there." <laughs> and uh, I, I, I thought it was some sort of clever wheeze, you know. And then I came out of the hide, and there was indeed a helicopter out there. And I was dressed as sort of anorak, and God knows what. I hadn't got a tape recorder, and I just thought, no can do, you know. <laughs> hello. Uh, hi. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Lynn, first of all, I'd like to say how lovely it's been to listen to you. I'm over well, here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Where? Uh, to your oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and secondly, um, um, I wondered... Having, as you described, fallen into interviewing, do you feel that the comparison between your penthouse fetishists interviewees and your celebrity interviewees have left you with uh, a liking for humanity or not? And do you like people? Oh, it's a difficult one, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, I, uh, liking is perhaps a bit too vague, but I, my total curiosity about an interest in people hugely remains, you know. And that's why I, I said on Desert Island Dis, if I were on a desert island, I couldn't live for five minutes, you know, without people to be interested in, as it were. Um, yeah, and liking... I mean, I like... I quite like oddballs, so f f for that reason, all the sort of weirdo sexual tastes, I always like those people, and I like their honesty in talking about it. Um... Yeah, I certainly, and I'm not as... It, I mean, there are some people uh, where you think there's a covert or sometimes even overt hatred of 
humanity and they want to reduce the population and just have them and some wildlife, you know. I wouldn't like that at all. Hello. <laughs> Up here. Oh, yes, hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I'd like to ask you about two things which particularly struck me about your book, uh, which fall into the... It couldn't be that awful category, could it? Couldn't um, be the one, word. Sorry. One is um, um, how awful you said your father was, and your husband didn't believe it until the incident with your daughter at breakfast. Yes. And, and the other, um, was it, uh, which also appeared in the film, when... Um, your head teacher said to you about this guy you were going to marry, um, that he was Jewish, and she said, oh, my God, you know they killed our Lord. And one, TV, uh, one film reviewer said, that was surely over the top. <laughs> you know, that, that this yes. didn't really happen. Um, and uh, wonderful, and I'd be uh, interested to hear your comments about those. Um, well, both things happened. Uh, the, I think the, the scene with the headmistress was... Um, sort of hyped up a bit in the film because actually I then went on to give some sassy answer about how odd of God to choose the Jews or something, um, which wasn't in my book and wasn't in real life. But um, certainly the headmistress had uh, made a remark about how can you marry a Jew and don't you know they killed our Lord? Yes. Um, as for, and the thing with my father, I mean, I'd always told my husband that my father used to hit me and um, and he hadn't believed me I don't think or he thought I was exaggerating and because obviously by the time I met David I was he was not hitting me um, but then David witnessed my father hitting our four-year-old daughter because she wouldn't um, eat her breakfast and de de you know when I say hit it was sort of like that you know I mean it's a I think what my father would call a clip around the ear, but actually rather a dangerous thing to do. Um, and David was more outraged and sort of said, we can never speak to him again. You know, we've got to, we had to come home. It was Christmas Day. Um, he, he thought it was really, really shocking, whereas I thought, oh, there's my father again. Um, anyway, it was true, yeah. Anything else? Oh, there's a lady. Oh. You mentioned um, the control that PRs oh, that, try and, uh, and have over interviews. I wonder if you ever agree that certain topics are off limits before interviews, and if you do, if you stick to it. Um, well, actually, it's... Um, I don't... Obviously, if, if it's some sort of really daft thing, like he, he will not talk about his private life, I mean, I will then say, well have you read any of my interviews, you know, there's not going to be anything much to talk about then. <laughs> um, if there's some if sometimes if there's some very specific thing, like I've had it that somebody's, I'd fixed to do an interview with somebody and learned that her sister had been carried off to a mental hospital like two days before, you know, and, um, and they said, can you not mention that? And I agreed I wouldn't and didn't. Um, but what often happens, and has just happened to me again with Courtney Love, is that PR says beforehand, on no account mention this, blah, 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 because it'll upset her. Sure enough, you know, halfway through the interview, Courtney Love starts <laughs> talking about herself and uh, is obviously a bit disappointed that I haven't raised it up till now, you know. <laughs> so you just don't know. Um, but if, if it's to do with... Um, I, I'm usually sympathetic to the idea of protecting things like sisters or children or people who aren't, you know, necessary, as it were, or who aren't the story. Um, I will. But when I interviewed Harriet Harman years ago, she, her PR had said before she won't answer any questions about her private life. And usually that just means about the marriage or something. But actually, she wouldn't even talk about her childhood. She wouldn't talk about... She wouldn't talk about her life, basically. Um, so that was a real standoff. And, and that's the other thing. If people say they won't talk about their private life, it can mean an enormous range of things, basically. OK. <laughs> Any more? Um, yes. Um, uh, does Jean there? Hello. 
Sorry. Oh, I've got one here. Sorry. Thank you. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Um, could you tell us... Oh, sorry. Could you tell us um, which person you've been most disappointed with in terms of your expectations and also um, who's most pleasantly surprised you? Ah, well, the pleasant surprise is, again, a recent one which have, hasn't gone into the magazine yet, but uh, Margaret Hodge, politician, um, I thought that she might be like Harriet Harman, and she wasn't. She was wonderful. She was really human and, and very just wonderfully friendly and open and got a huge hinterland, you know, she's got a real life, she's not like most politicians. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was a pleasant surprise because I'd gone in thinking it might be quite sort of uptight. Um, disappointed by, well, I've, it, it's in my book, Martin Clunes, and I mean, he could not sort of, I mean, A, I adore Doc Martin, B, I really believed he was a nice bloke, and I came away with um, a different opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we take one final question? Yeah. Is oh. there anyone that, you're, that you've been particularly nervous about interviewing? Um, well, yes, I'm I am nervous of interviewing... Um, well, I suppose, say, Mark Hodge, somewhere where I think I'm completely out of my depth in that I don't know enough about politics or... I mean, I always feel fairly confident interviewing writers because I can read their stuff and understand it, you know. Um, musicians I'm, and artists I'm fairly confident with, but... Uh, I, I, one thing I'm reluctant, well, I'm sort of wary of, is film directors, because I just feel I don't know enough about what film directing is or what it entails. Um, and so I know that somebody's very good at it, but I can't sort of particularly ask any questions. So that's the sort of thing that makes me nervous. Um, I'm, actually, I'm always nervous going into it, into it just because I think... I might screw up, you know, but, um, but nervous where I feel I'm not really on top of the subject and I, I'm struggling. Has anyone actually frightened you or threatened you, indeed, in an interview? Uh, a very nasty... Well, I better not say that. Um, <laughs> there was a man called Jimmy Boyle who went, was a murderer, a gang thing, who went to prison in Scotland you know, for a long, long time, and then came out and was a reformed character and running an arts centre and married his social worker and all the rest of it. He didn't like my piece. <laughs> and I got... Well, it was a phone call that just sort of... I, I feel we need to talk um, afterwards. And I thought, oh, I really don't need to talk. <laughs> um, and I was quite scared. I mean, I... I no, no explicit threat was made, and maybe he didn't intend it, but the way he was sort of, well, I've talked, you know, you've, I've talked to you, now you've got to talk to me or something, and I just thought, I don't like that. Um, no, I mean, I th I'm sure if I were a man, I mean, I think that's why we have a lucky time of it as women, that, you know, if I were a man, somebody might have punched me by now, but I sort of believe that, maybe wrongly, that they won't punch me. <laughs> well, um, I think we're out of time, so I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming today, and above all, Lynn Barber, the greatest interviewer of the age. <laughs>